chair this session. We have only 45 minutes for three presentations. Uh, so I'm going to let um, Chris Sweetie go uh, to speak. And I'm not even going to spend time introducing you. You are quite well known in what you do. And I'll take time away from your speech. So I think you'll have a few more minutes to speak because of lack of, lack of introduction. Fantastic. Yeah, thank, thank, you, thank you very much. Well, it's a real, a real honor to be here. So thank you very much for inviting me. Um, I, I, uh, the, uh, the Honorable Secretary was saying that everyone here in the econo is an economist. Actually, I'm not an economist. I'm a doctor. Um, and uh, my profession my, has uh, learned the hard way um, that uh, it's very easy for all experts to agree that a particular thing is a very good idea and it for, for it to be absolutely wrong. Um, I've illustrated this uh, from uh, some of the work that uh, my colleagues a couple of hundred years ago used to do, uh, curing people by putting leeches on them, bleeding them, and various other things we now do know do active harm. I'm sure that the medical profession is still doing active harm, but at least we have learned that some of the things we do are very, very stupid. But the point that I wanted to make on this is that everybody agreed that these very stupid things were excellent because they had not tested them. If you do not test, you do not know which of the things you're doing are, uh, are, are actually doing harm rather than good. Um, clinical trials, of course, is one of the methods by which this can happen. And my generation of doctors was very heavily influenced by a trial that came out in the year that I qualified. That will tell you how old I am if you read that, if you, if you can read that very carefully. Um, and the trial came out uh, showing that um, the then standard treatment for heart disease, and it's a rising problem here in India at the moment, uh, had, uh, you had a 13% mortality. So if you, if you had a heart attack, 13% of people with a heart attack would die. If you gave them a single aspirin tablet costing around two cents, that mortality dropped by 20%. And then a further relatively cheap intervention took it down another 30%. So one trial showed a reduction in mortality from the single biggest cause of mortality in our country by 40%. This is a very clear demonstration that actually if you test things rigorously, you can change practice in a very dramatic way. Now, of course, most things are not that dramatic, but it is possible to have quite profound influences by doing experimental tests across the whole range of policy. Um, I've illustrated this in a bit of shameless, shameless uh, self-promotion for the British government's effort to support things uh, with the trials that have been done here in India on scuba rice. This is a kind of rice that can survive uh, prolonged pr flooding, which is a major problem, uh, particularly in the area uh, bordering Bangladesh, and also in Bangladesh, actually. Um, but I, I, there are good trials and good experimental studies which have changed practice or policy in all of the major areas of, uh, of government uh, activity, both here in India but also in the UK. Agriculture, policing, we've done some interesting trials of numbers of police officers you need to have in the underground to deter people who are thieves. Uh, education, cash transfers, and this has led to a situation where our cabinet office in the UK has put together what's called a What Work Centre, which is something which is actually trying to promote the use of experimental trials in every government department or state in the UK. So uh, th we all know that the experimental methods are very powerful. And for policy, they have a lump large number of advantages over and above the technical advantages that all of you know. I would say that the uh, biggest ones are actually that they produce a very clear result. Of course, they also uh, remove bias if they are well done between the different studies. And in political terms, this makes two things possible. The first of which is it makes it possible to do new things that we hadn't realized worked before. That is, I think, the less important one. The much more important one is it makes it possible to prove that things do not work and stop them. Because I think anyone who's worked in policy is aware of the fact it is much more difficult to stop an existing program than it is to start a new one. And you actually need something that demonstrates incredibly clearly that current practice is not working before politicians have sufficient support that they can with withdraw them. And I think some of the distinguished speakers earlier on gave some very good examples of existing Indian programs which are very difficult to stop until there is clear evidence they are not working. So proving something doesn't work is as important as it does. But clearly, trials are often the wrong tool uh, for policy questions, and they're always insufficient if they're used on their own. Many questions can't be done by trials because just the methodology would not suit the particular question, particularly for the, the, the more complex multifactorial uh, issues. Uh, or trials may be a very expensive way to do a, 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 an intervention or an impact evaluation when much cheaper or more efficient methods exist. And they seldom tell you why something works. 
and therefore how you can improve it. They just say, does it work or does it not? So they have some, they are very good, and I come from a trials background myself, but they have some significant limitations. And of course, you always have to do things alongside them. You need to do cost effective in the studies, you need to do uh, social studies alongside them. A trial on its own is relatively, un is, is, is not sufficient to change uh, policy. So um, then we move on to observational data and what you can do on this. And actually, the, the first really large-scale example of this came from work done by Florence Nightingale, who never, who never visited India, but on in data in India. And she influenced Indian government and UK uh, policy in India very profoundly by looking at routine data and demonstrating that many things which officials had just not spotted in their own data actually proved that certain things were working, certain things were not. And the result of this is incrementally, these led to a substantial impact on sanitation, agriculture, and irrigation in this country, which she had never actually visited. Um, so so um, quantitative data can be extremely powerful, even when it's not experimental. But it is also very important not to ignore, and I think the false dichotomy has occasionally arisen in the impact evaluation community between people who absolutely believe in randomized trial methods, and particularly uh, and other quantitative methods, and those in the qualitative uh, social sciences. The reality is that quantitative methods are never sufficient on their own. You always need to have social components to them, uh, and you almost always will need social sciences, even for your trials, to help provide formative research. And you'll need qualitative social research to explain why the results that you had came out and what you can do to improve them as well as, of course, needing economic analysis, looking at the driver's behaviour, and very importantly, the political context, because a trial result does not translate directly into political change. You need then to think through how it's going to be done. So integrating the quantitative methods of impact evaluations and other things with the qualitative social sciences is absolutely essential if what you're trying to do is change policy. Just a few comments, and then I, then I will close, because I'm aware of the, uh, the um, pressures on time. Uh, from our UK experience on why does existing evidence not get into policy. So I'm not talking about new things, but why you've got a huge body of evidence and you, many of us know that what we know is not exactly what happens. Why is that? Well, in UK terms, and I don't know whether this is as true in India, the biggest barrier is time. Between ministers choosing to uh, make a decision and the, that being executed can be a matter of weeks or months. That clearly gives almost no time for people to, as to assemble all the evidence that needs to be uh, brought to bear to make a serious evidence-informed policy decision. And of course, there are four possible approaches if you're the official asked to advise a minister. Uh, the first of them is to ignore the evidence altogether. That's very time efficient. Um, uh, the second uh, is to uh, decide what you're going to do and then do a Google search to find a bit of evidence that supports what you do and put a footnote that suggests that somehow that this is clearly lying with evidence, but it is, uh, of course, quite attractive. Uh, the third approach, which is quite commonly used, is to phone an expert friend. I, 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 I turn to you know, Howard and I phone him up and I say, right, what should I do? And he will give me his prejudices and I will then write them down and say an expert told me this is the right way to do it. And this is also a very common approach in policy. None of these clearly is the right way to actually approach evidence. Much more importantly, what we need to do is to get evidence in a state it is useful for policy well in advance of need. Um, and I'll come on to uh, one of the key issues on that. But there, of course, that's not the only barrier, and there are many other barriers. The first of them is, I think, very often people who are researchers or um, evalu evaluators uh, really fail to appreciate the continuum between purely technical decisions and purely political decisions. Some decisions are purely political. So the decision for a minister uh, to put money, for example, into malaria control to stop children dying in Assam from malaria or into child's edu uh, girls' education in, uh, in, in, uh, in Kerala, that is a political decision. In fact, evaluation and research have no part to play in that. On the other hand, once you've actually decided you're going to try and improve malaria conditions in Assam, then you actually have a purely technical decision on your hands as to what to do about it. And I've illustrated this with Sir Roland Ross, uh, Indian, Indian born, uh, did his experiments in India, which led to the second Nobel Prize for Medicine for all the work in uh, malaria he did. So, and that still is the foundation for most of what we do around the world on that. The second thing where we all shoot ourselves in both feet is incomprehensible technical language. Uh, I, would say I, I would say anthropologists and economists probably been my joint top prize for the worst language use. Uh, at least my trader talked to, to, talk to people on a sort of day-to-day -day basis. But I think we should all of us read our own documents and wince. 
uh, at, the, uh, at the degree of convolution of, of us trying to explain what are essentially often quite simple concepts. Political issues can come in in particular areas, but I have to say my own experience in the UK government is it's very rare that a minister will choose to go against clear evidence partly because it is politically extremely dangerous for them to do so. Nothing is more embarrassing for a minister in parliament than being confronted with a killer fact that proves they're wrong. So I don't, in my experience, find that, that, that politicians say, well, I don't like your evidence and I'm just going to ignore it if it's really strong evidence. Obviously, if it's more contested, that's different. Researchers often don't help themselves because they frequently exaggerate the importance of their evidence or the strength of their evidence. And, and actually, most politicians and the officials advising them are pretty smart, and they can spot when people are exaggerating. They don't like it, and they tend to ignore it if that happens. And of course, there's fashion. Uh, and fashion is surprisingly important in policy decisions. W why we're doing one set of uh, things in development uh, this five years compared to the previous five years, some of it's based on evidence, but some of it, I have to say, is a fashion issue. Um, but uh, the one area where I think we can do a, a lot to help ourselves is to realize that presenting evidence for policy does require us to incorporate all the different dis um, disciplines. Uh, and this is my final substantive um, slide. And I think that the thing in which we are probably doing least well, and one of the things where I think 3IE has been fantastic in what it has done as one of the co-sponsors of this, uh, this trial, is systematic synthesis. Bringing together information in, in ideally through a systematic review, which is a way of trying to produce less biased information, but there are other ways of doing it, uh, where you can bring together information from multiple different areas and test the quality of it, because there's a lot of information out there that is rubbish, and then stick to the, em the evid evidence that is uh, good quality evidence, wherever it has come from, and present that in a systematic way. So that policymakers can then take that and they can say, this is not just one study showing this, this is the whole evidence, and here's the bit of it that, is, uh, that is, seems appropriate to my uh, state or my country. Uh, doing this, I think, is one of the greatest things that we as, uh, as practitioners can do to help the policy community. And I, I really want to commend 3 IE for their work on this uh, and all of those who supported them in doing this. We all know, however, that at this point in time, there are very, very many policy decisions and practice decisions across India, across the UK, and every country we all of us work in, uh, which are the equivalent of the medieval medical leeches. Everybody agrees they work, they've never been tested, and they're probably doing active harm. And we do have responsibility, I think, to test things much more rigorously and then present the evidence in a systematic way to policymakers. Thank you very much. Describing his qualifications because you will see from his presentation that uh, we will be very enriched by what we are going to hear. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, <coughs> good afternoon, everybody. Uh, <coughs> it's, it's a real privilege to be here in this meeting. Uh, it is for the first time that I'm attending any CIE meeting. And uh, the kind of things that you do are very close to my heart. And uh, I, when I've been listening to all of the all the presentation this morning, I st I started feeling really at home because the 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 the, the phrases you use, for example, implementation, uh, uh, these are something which are very uh, important, and we, we give a lot of <coughs> attention to 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 this year's BRAC, for which I work. So what I'm going to do is really to uh, uh, sort of share with you some of the experiences that we have from, from, from BRAC, which is a action organization. Research is not our main job, but we, we use research to improve our performance, to improve implementation. So that's what I'm going to do. I'll, I'll try to be brief as much as possible. Uh, so this is a quick kind of, kind of outline. So uh, uh, for those who don't know about BRAC, I'll speak a little bit about BRAC and then introduce the research and the evaluation division. Uh, which has been working for, for BRAC uh, and, then, and then present uh, in brief three case studies uh, on, on evaluations that, that, that we have done numerous evaluations, but I chose 
uh, three of them for 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 uh, uh, sharing with you. And then finally, uh, uh, perhaps if th there is a time, uh, say a little bit about some of the lessons learned. Now, BRAC, as, as you perhaps know, is an NGO which was established in Bangladesh uh, after the War of Liberation. And the goal of BRAC is poverty alleviation and empowerment of the poor. It's quite a large NGO pro by, by many measures. It is prob probably the largest NGO in the world. Uh, as you can see that we have a total staff strength of 120,000 or more than that. And the total budget for last year was about $650 million. And uh, we are quite self-sufficient, not fully, or we are self-sufficient only 70%. Uh, but for the, which means that for the rest 30%, we have to depend on donors like this, for example. Uh, his, uh, uh, DFID is our, one of our major, major, major donors. And since 19, uh, 2002, uh, BRAC has been working uh, globally. BRAC, BRAC now works in 10 other countries as well. Uh, uh, th uh, this is in uh, quick, the, about the scale of BRAC, for example. Uh, we have done a huge uh, ORT study, which is oral rehydration therapy for diarrhea. Uh, we have a huge microfinance program that reaches five million borrowers in many countries. Uh, we run uh, the largest primary uh, uh, schooling system in the private sector in the world. Uh, we also have trained more than 100,000 community health workers in many countries. And we also have many innovative programs such as uh, uh, reaching out to the ultra poor, which I'm going to talk about. Uh, what are the BRAC mantras? I'm not going to uh, go through all these, but I want to uh, 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 draw your attention to the second bullet and the last bullet. Uh, Bangladesh, uh, BRAC, we consider it as a learning organi organization in the sense that we learn from our experience, we learn from our, uh, from our mistakes. And uh, uh, this learning is helped by, uh, by uh, units like the Research and Evaluation Division, uh, which is an independent unit within, within BRAC, uh, which was set up back in 1975 within three years of the founding of BRAC. And the research department is quite big as well, probably one of the largest in any NGO anywhere in the world with over 100 staff. And we work with many other institutions as well in, in order to achieve what we want to achieve through our goals. Uh, we use all kinds of tools for our evaluation, as Chris was saying, uh, which is which is important. We feel that uh, mixed method is, is obviously uh, very important for understanding what is going on in your programs. Uh, now, about the f uh, first case study, uh, uh, we, we have been working on poverty alleviation for uh, since the beginning, but we have discovered that uh, uh, with our programs, we haven't been reaching the bottom 15% of the population, which we call the ultra poor. And then we developed a program uh, uh, back in the uh, 2001, and, uh, uh, which, which, which was essentially uh, to empower the ultra poor uh, and uh, also to graduate them out of ultra poverty. And uh, uh, this is quite a dense slide, I don't want to read uh, uh, everything, but what it, show, what it says, is that the ultra poor program is based on what we call the asset transfer. So we give asset to the ultra poor and they provide them all technical support in order for them to uh, yeah, use that asset to the best possible way. Uh, uh, for this program, uh, we, we have already three phases. The third phase is going on. In phase one, we, we reached about 100,000 uh, uh, ultra poor in 15 districts of Bangladesh. And in phase two, we reached about 300,000 of them. And uh, this, this project has become quite popular outside Bangladesh. And uh, this is being replicated by uh, these uh, uh, CGAP and the, uh, the, and the World Bank and the Ford Foundation and many, the, many other countries. <coughs> uh, <coughs> I, I'm, I'm so, sort of sharing with you some results from, from the phase one, phase one evaluation as well as the phase two evaluation. And in, in, in phase two, we started a longitudinal uh, study uh, which, uh, to, to which used both the, um, uh, the quantitative as well as the qualitative methods. The quantitative method used the difference in difference methodology uh, and uh, we, we had a baseline which was followed by uh, two, um, uh, two sort of follow-up surveys as you can see in the bottom of this. 
but so what is sound? Uh, <coughs> when we started the program in 2002, we had a baseline which, which uh, uh, identified who, who, who are the uh, people that are being reached by the program as ultra poor. And we found that about 85% uh, were actually targeted correctly. Now, after three years of the program, what, what you are seeing, what we saw, is that 47% uh, uh, of those who are still ultra poor, but 53% have graduated out of ultra poverty. Now, we did a, another follow-up survey uh, in 2008, and uh, the last column is showing what is the current situation. Uh, out of the 47 percent poor who were in uh, 2000, uh, 2005, uh, on, only 6 percent still remain to be alt uh, uh, in ultra poverty, but 41 percent actually graduated out of ultra poverty and became a, uh, a non-ultra poor. Uh, and those who were, who were in the non-poor category in, 1940 in, in uh, 2005, we, we see that 2% 2, 2 of them have actually sort of receded back into ultra poverty, but 51% have continued to uh, 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 remain uh, outside or, 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 or keep, uh, keep themselves uh, uh, graduated into uh, uh, non-ultra poverty group which means that 51% uh, uh, and 41%, which is about 92%. So uh, of, the, of the ultra poor households which we started in uh, 2002, 92% were still uh, sort of out of ultra poverty even, even six years after the program. So, so this shows that the, that the program was working quite well and has been quite successful in, in, in graduation. Uh, we also have done other uh, kind of things, uh, such as uh, the improvement in per capita income and also the calorie intake, which also shows uh, the positive changes, as you can see. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm sort of uh, running quite fast. We also used a lot of uh, uh, ethnographic methods in order to understand what is going on. And this picture show the, the current status of these ultra, ultra poor households, uh, which have improved and uh, and have been quite quite happy through uh, through this program. And when when one of the ethnographers asked one of the ultra poor person about what what change has gone into into her uh, uh, into her life, and she said, "You ask what has changed? Can't you see? I mean, uh, uh, showing what 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 she has at home. You wouldn't have asked the question if you saw me and my house before." So uh, the use of uh, uh, qualitative aspects, qualitative methodology, help to understand what is going on in the program. I'm not going to. Now about the, in the evolution of the phase two, uh, we thought that we should also uh, introduce some randomization. So we, we use the RCT uh, uh, in this. And uh, uh, in this study, we also collaborated with the LSE and the University of Colorado London, and also University of Bacona in, in, in Italy. And uh, some of the key results from that second phase study is that the occupational choices of the ultra poor has changed. The treated women who received support from RAC spent 92% more hours of self-employment and 26% less hours in wage employment. Also, the labor productivity has increased by 15% and earnings by 38%. <coughs> also, 15%, for example, has 15% uh, uh, increase in self-reported self, uh, life satisfaction. And more importantly, uh, they overtook the near poor and began to close the gap with the middle class women uh, on occupational choices, regulative earnings such as a household per capita expenditure and quote unquote happiness. Now, the second case. Uh, uh, as you know that diarrhea used to be a major cause of mortality in Bangladesh and morbidity. So, so the ORT, the oral rehydration therapy was developed in Bangladesh, but it was not available to the people. So Breck decided to develop a homemade solution, which, which we call the, uh, the salt and sugar solution. And we decided to teach every mother in Bangladesh on how to make this solution at home uh, with, with salt and sugar. And this program was done over a 10 year period between 1980 and 1990. And black workers went from house to house and taught mothers about how to, how to, how to do that. And it, in this program, 
uh, we also used what was what was mentioned this morning about the 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 uh, performance based uh, salary for the workers. So the <coughs> workers who were teaching OT mothers were paid according to how much retention the mother has on OT. And uh, the assessment of the program uh, initially was more on the safety of the solution, whether the mother was able to make the solution correctly. Uh, but, but an early assessment uh, uh, showed that, that the, the use of the solution was very low. Uh, this was quite a kind of a frustration for us because we thought that if we give the technology to the mothers, they will start using it. But we found that initially only less than 10% were using it. So this was quite beyond our, our imagination. So we started a research program to understand what is going on in the dynamics of usage of ORT. And we found many problems with the, uh, with the program. One of them was that the health workers who are teaching the mothers, they themselves are not, not convinced about the efficacy of ORT. So what we did, we, we brought them to Dhaka, the health workers, and put them in the ICDDRB, which is the International Center for Diarrheal Disease Research, to see for themselves how ORT works. So they saw for themselves how ORT works, and they were convinced. So when they went back, the, uh, uh, they were more convinced that they could uh, tell the mothers better about, about the efficacy of ORT, and the, the use rate started to uh, 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 go up. Similarly, we found that uh, there are a, a lot of rumors that uh, if the mothers give the solution to the uh, children, uh, the children when they grow up, uh, they will become sterile. I mean, those kind of rumors were there. Uh, also, that we found that, that the doctors were against this because this was against their business. And that also that, uh, that uh, uh, there are four types of diarrhea which we didn't understand at that time when the program was done. And uh, we, we used only the word diarrhea, which meant only one kind of di real diarrhea. So we changed the whole message. And what, what has of all these kind of changes that, the, that we have brought into the program has really led to a lot of improvements in usage. Now, Bangladesh has the highest ORT usage in the world. More than 80% of the uh, episodes of diarrhea are given ORT. ORT has now become a part of the local culture and also said to be very important in uh, uh, achieving you know, whatever that we have been able to achieve in improving uh, child survival in Bangladesh. Uh, thirdly and lastly is the uh, impact assessment that, uh, that we did on, on uh, measuring the impact of, uh, of microfinance and education program on health. Uh, the 1993 World Development Report that talked about the, the, the synergy and, the, and the, the relationship between development and health. But they didn't really put up much, much information on whether, uh, whether, uh, whether a non-health program can have an impact on health. So we, we thought that this is something that we can look at in one of the areas where the ICDDRB had a uh, uh, democratic surveillance system since 1963. So, 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 uh, uh, BRAC implemented that program in that, and we used the, the democratic surveillance system to understand the impact of this program on child mortality, because ICDDRB had those data, uh, sort of. Uh, so, so. And we found that the program had all kinds of impact on nutrition, family planning, women's empowerment, and also child survival, as it is shown in this graph. And as you can see that the, the dotted lines are the uh, uh, child survival experience of the members, children, uh, uh, members of BRAC. And if we compare that with the bottom line, which is the pink line, uh, there's the control. So you see that there has been a huge improvement uh, in child, sur child survival of the, of, the, of the children who uh, received BRAC inputs. And in, uh, indeed, if we compare the non-poor, non-members, for example, who are the richer sections, so it shows that the, the, the gap between the rich and the poor has been uh, sort of uh, reduced greatly and the, uh, the, the experience is almost the similar between, between these two groups. So finally, what, 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 what lessons have been learned through our exper experience in, in research? Uh, we have been uh, doing this since 1975 as part of BRAC. 
And BRAC, as you know, is not a research organization. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a development organization. It's an action organization. And uh, uh, we feel that, that uh, unless research becomes an important part of the organization, uh, we cannot implement programs well. So we feel that it is a sine qua non for uh, the, the, the effectiveness of the program. Uh, but but we, the research has to be uh, uh, independent and they have to have freedom to decide what to do and what not to do. So, and the researcher must uh, have to ensure the objectivity of the research and also that, that the higher management who decides, the, the policy makers, uh, 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 need to have the, the buy-in, which is fortunately there in, in, in BRAC. And of course, there are many challenges uh, in, in this. Uh, a, a major challenge is the short supply uh, and uh, high demand outside, outside for researchers whom we train. Uh, the, uh, you know that the universities in our part of the world, they really don't train researchers. So, so, so the researchers have to be trained through uh, 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 through work, and once uh, once they are trained, they, are, uh, uh, they obviously get uh, uh, better jobs at in, in Bangladesh and out, outside. So, so they leave. So the uh, the short supply of research that is a perennial problem uh, that that uh, that that we feel. Also, the uh, challenge is the uh, uh, reducing the no do gap, which is uh, that 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 that. Uh, you have a research, and then how do we implement that? And how do you make the, the program people accept that and, and implement that in your program? And fortunately, in BRAC, we haven't really had much of a problem on that. Uh, 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 I'm, I'm almost done. And one of the, one of the things that, that we have seen is that there is a huge difference between the number of uh, researchers which are left at the first draft and, and the number of researchers which are actually published so which which means that that uh, that uh, that which uh, which also related to to the to the capacity of the of the, of the researchers and uh, it, it, is, it is important that this gap is also minimized so that, so that we know the quality uh, of the research is, is good and finally uh, is there a misplaced emphasis uh, we, uh, we hear a lot about RCTs and also the outcome indicators, and, and of course, as, as, as I'm so happy to hear it here, here the, 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 uh, uh, the issue of impact assessment, the, the issue of implementation research, the, the issue of uh, 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 delivery. And that's why we are also hearing the question, the, 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 uh, the new science of delivery. Uh, which I think is, uh, we, we have to think about that and really put our emphasis on how do we really improve that science of delivery so that we are able to uh, 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 implement the programs. And uh, as has been said in the pre uh, uh, previous session, that, that we have ideas, but we need to implement them. Thank you. Third speaker is uh, Graciela uh, Teril Bellisman. <laughs> Bellisman is. Uh, she comes from uh, Coneval in uh, Mexico, which is a very well known institution for doing uh, impact evaluations, and she will speak on the Mexican experience. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs> I would like to start by thanking um, UIE for the invitation to be here and a privilege to be able to share. Uh, Mexico's experience with respect to evaluation in this forum. So I'm going to start by giving a little bit of context. Um, before the year 2000, there was actually uh, very little interest, if at all, on conducting any kinds of evaluations in Mexico. It was uh, not until the year 2000 when there was a decree, a Congress decree, whereby there had to be a every year evaluations of all federal programs. <coughs> and it was not because the Congress was interested in improving social policy. It was really because there was a mistrust that the executive would spend uh, resources for uh, campaigning or for the electorate. In 2005, 
uh, the law of social development created uh, Carnival. Carnival is the National Council for the Evaluation of Social Policy. And uh, this uh, institution has uh, two main mandates. The first one is to uh, measure poverty at the national level, at the state, and at the municipal level. And the measurement of poverty has to be done in a multidimensional way. And the second mandate is to conduct the evaluation of social policy in general in Mexico, and in particular of every social program uh, in the country. Uh, one of the unique, uh, unique features of Coneval is that uh, in its board, it's part of the executive, but in its board, uh, it has eight seats, six of which are occupied by academic members, which are supposed to remain in their uh, academic institutions and they're uh, bringing the technical and scientific uh, support to Carnival and at the same time uh, uh, it gives it a flavor of independence of the government. So uh, what does Carnival do? When we came to Carnival, there were, I mean, the task was huge. We had to evaluate more than 200 uh, programs, social programs, and it was impossible to think of conducting 200 uh, evaluation, uh, impact evaluations. So what we did is we thought of a system that would start giving immediate results. Uh, <coughs> Sorry. No, it's, it's okay. That would start giving immediate results with respect to monitoring and evaluation. Thank you. And, um, and at the same time, uh, construct in this, uh, in this system the impact evaluation. So uh, Carnival, what Carnival has to do is uh, from, uh, dictate all the guidelines for evaluation of all federal programs in Mexico, and, and we do this together with the Ministry of Finance. And so we're very much based, thank you very much, on uh, producing results. So uh, if you look at, on the left side, we have the planning. Uh, so we use the National Development Plan, and we have a logical framework for every program in the federal government. And on the right-hand side, we have what we call the evaluation system. So we have an annual evaluation plan where we say uh, which program has to be evaluated and why, and using which kind of methodology. So we have all sorts of evaluations. We have design evaluations, consistency evaluation, processes evaluation, uh, policy evaluation and uh, impact evaluation as well. So impact evaluation is just one part of this whole evaluation system. So from all of the results that we get from these evaluations, we do uh, recommendations and we sit, as you will see, we sit together with each of the program leaders and we uh, provide recommendations and we follow those recommendations. We follow what happens afterwards with those recommendations. And then we conduct an annual report where we summarize all of these results. So I'm just going to give you um, uh, very fast uh, what comes out of some of the most important evaluations that we have. So this is from the design evaluation. This we have for every program, uh, of for every social program. So we uh, know which, uh, this is a milk program. So it belongs to goal five, which is uh, to reduce uh, extreme poverty and assure equal opportunities. So the goal is to improve the nutritional level of the poor children and pregnant women. And the uh, purpose is that beneficiaries have access to this fortified milk. So for each of, uh, so for each of the programs, we have um, an evaluation on four different topics. The first is the design, the strategic planning, target population and coverage, and the operation. So in a very schematic way, we can see how each of these programs is doing with respect to each of these uh, topics. So we have, for example, in this particular program is doing very well in terms of design, it's 100%. And then strategic planning, not so well, 71%, and so on. So with colors, in a very schematic way, you can see right away what's going on with each of the programs. So we have uh, this uh, board, um, with respect to all the social programs, and you can divide them even by ministry. So this is, for example, looking at the Ministry of Social Development and all of the programs that that ministry has. So that ministry is able to look at all the colors and see uh, how, th how it's doing with respect to the different programs and where more effort has uh, to be put. So coming from a different uh, evaluation, so this is from the uh, performance evaluation, we have uh, these other kind of results which are also very schematic. And this is 
on the rows, you have uh, different um, uh, programs, and on the columns, you have indicators for different uh, indicators of performance. So uh, the first one is uh, whether there's an impact of the program, the second one, improvements on the achievements of the program, improvements on the delivery of the services, and so on. And then the last two color, the, the one, below, one before the last column is the progressivity level. So we're very much in Mexico into having uh, programs that are more progressive, more directed, directed towards the poor. So um, if you look at, in general, this kind of scheme, you can also see how, um, how we're doing with respect to the different indicators that are drawn from the, from the previous um, evaluations. So what are some of the results? So what do we use all this information for? So uh, we have now poverty, poverty figures at the national level, state, and municipal level, and we can follow those um, indicators through time, and those in itself are indicators of how well uh, the government is performing with respect to reducing poverty. Oops, sorry. Uh, so we can track those indicators over time and we can see what's happening at the municipal, state, and the national level. So we have um, 550 logical frameworks for, for different programs. We have 20% of all indicators of those 550 are uh, results indicators. We have 140 programs that are evaluated every year. We can find all of these results by in, in the internet, in the Conoval uh, page. Um, we have also, we take into the consideration the program's point of view. So we don't only evaluate and, and, and point out what's wrong with the evaluations, but we also take into consideration what the program leaders have to say about it. And each program director uh, makes a work plan on how to make those things better, those things that Carnival is pointing out. The media and the NGO constantly use these evaluations. And um, these evaluations since 2010 have been used to inform and to conform uh, the budget. So what are the changes in policies and programs that we have had with these results? The Ministry of Finance has used, as I said, the evaluations uh, in 2011 and 12 for budget process uh, very systematically. The presidency redefined the public policies intended to tackle maternal mortality based on the diagnosis of the logical framework. Uh, there have been programs that have been closed, such as the first job program, because of the information that we got from the design evaluation. Um, the design of one of the most international and famous programs, uh, Progresa, formerly now Oportunidades, was also changed in order to increase attendance and to um, increase nutrition. And uh, the budget for one of the recent programs, which is called Piso Firme, which is a program that provides cement floors to poor households, has also increased uh, very dramatically, actually, in the last years, uh, given the evaluation results. So with respect to uh, impact evaluation, there is actually <coughs> There's actually like two stages or two mechanisms through which they take place in Mexico. The first one is like a very independent mechanism which were, uh, they're actually done at, by universities or by uh, private NGOs. But the formal one, the one that is nourished, in the, or, or that is nourished by this uh, system is the one that takes place within uh, Carnival uh, or that follows Carnival guidelines. And this is uh, this part of this bigger system. Uh, it complements the results that we obtain from here. It complements other results from other evaluations, and uh, they're really taken into consideration as a tool to to make better decisions, to inform public policy, and to improve accountability. So, um, I don't have much time, right? I'm only going to pick. I was going to talk about uh, four programs, but I'm only going to pick uh, just one, which is this one. And this is the very well-known uh, program, Progresa Oportunidades. It started in 1997, and the evaluation uh, has been very famous. And uh, uh, since, why, why is this um, evaluation very important? Is because everyone who has been in Mexico knows that every six years, the country invents itself. So every six years, we have elections, we have new parties coming, and we forget about everything that 
happened before and all the social programs get reinvented. And this is the first program that given that it was very rigorously evaluated, uh, gave enough evidence in order not to stop the program, not to close it, and not to reinvent it again. So it's been alive since 1997. It has uh, survived uh, three administrations and even changes of party within those administrations. So this was a, a randomized trial and it was conducted by IFPRI and it's a, 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 a randomized, uh, uh, it's a, sorry, it's a cash transfer program uh, who's intended to alleviate uh, poverty in Mexico. And it's, um, uh, it was demand driven by the Ministry of Finance. And the results show very useful. And uh, basically the first results were at the rural level and they increased, uh, we found that they increased nutrition, increased school enrollment and uh, health and nutrition. Okay, I'm, uh, I'm just gonna skip all this. And <coughs> so what's happening today? So today there's a, a very big strategy against poverty. It's called the uh, uh, hunger crusade. And uh, what Carnival is starting to do now, rather than uh, wait until the program uh, starts to be rolled out, is as in its uh, original uh, design stage, we're working together with the government to plan uh, different kinds of evaluations, one of which is going to be an impact evaluation, so that uh, we can work with them to change uh, the design and to see what the results are going to be uh, coming out and be able to change it before it's it's probably too late. Too late. So, what are um, four things that these are four things that we have learned are necessary to be in place in order to have a good M and E uh, system? The first is an institutional input, which is nobody really wants to be uh, evaluated, so it's impossible to have a public M and E if there is no uh, change in institution. So there has to be like. Uh, an evaluation mandate or uh, an evaluation unit or something that is created in order to uh, allow this institutional uh, change to, to happen. Another thing is technical. Uh, when we started Carnival, we wanted to mandate many, many different impact evaluations, but we found out that we either had to hire them abroad or we had to start um, um, training evaluators in Mexico because there was really actually None, none, non evaluation, non evaluators there. Uh, also, we have to produce good uh, indicators and that feed the planning stage. And uh, if there is no information in place, we have to create information, we have to create surveys, collect um, uh, administrative records, etc. So, information is, and good quality information is essential for, the, for, for evaluation. So what are some uh, recommendations? Uh, first, uh, take into account the program managers. It's, it's, uh, as, as I was hearing this morning lectures, uh, it's sometimes very tempting just to have like the stick, right? And, but in Mexico, we have followed a different approach. We actually have the carrots instead of only the stick. So we take into account the, uh, what uh, program managers have to say and we work very closely with them in order to <coughs> to take into consideration what they have to say and to show them that evaluation is really about improving public policy together. Uh, so program managers sh should be heard. Programs and external evaluators have permanent meetings throughout the evaluation process. Um, the final recommendations are analyzed by the program's leader before they come out. And even the program leaders can propose to substitute some of the recommendations. And uh, the program makes public statements about the external evaluation and makes compromises about what and how they're going to take into consideration the, um, the suggestions that are being made. So uh, another recommendation is show methodologies in the most transparent way. Well, we have to have a clear, understandable publications that are important and that it's important to translate the technical results that are derived from the evaluations to the general public. And the last thing, which is something we're still struggling with in Mexico, is to improve the capacity building of the local uh, researchers. Thank you.
for the importance of evidence. Uh, the other case of a, uh, a large NGO uh, where uh, evaluation has been made very much a part of the culture of the, uh, of the NGO's activities on a regular basis, which is quite unusual. And uh, a very institutionalized program in Mexico of uh, using evaluations for social programs. And given the large amount of money that is spent in India, I can see tremendous amount of scope now that uh, Mr. Chibar is here and others are working on evaluations to see how one can use evaluations in a very institutionalized and professional way to improve policy. So uh, here you have people, you can, you have five minutes to ask questions to see what we can learn from their experience. <coughs> yes. And if there are more questions, and since there are only five minutes, I'll probably allow more questions to be collected before we have them answered. Okay, it's back now, yes. Uh, I'm Abhishek Pandit from sure. the London School of Economics. Uh, the question is to Mrs. Belis Meres. Uh, first of all, it's very heartening to see how Mexico has been running this very well-integrated system of evaluation. Just a small question to do with one of your programs. You showed us that framework, a little snapshot of what a report looks like, and it was mostly doing very well on most counts. There was one I noticed which seemed to be running into trouble. I just thought I'd look into that to, to see what, uh, how the government approaches problematic uh, programs that are running into uh, pro difficulties. So that one was, I think, to do with uh, immunization, vaccinations. I think it was, uh, I read, Enfermedades uh, Imprevenibles por Vaccinación. So I'm guessing that was an immunization program. So I'm just, guess, I'm just curious as to what programs have been difficult for Mexico and how the government is planning to sort out those issues. Yes. Excuse me, can you take the mic over there, please? <coughs> and, okay. okay, I'm going to allow only two more questions because I'm told we have only five minutes. Uh, I'm Shonali Khan from Breakthrough. We are an NGO working on women's rights. Uh, it's sometimes very difficult, and this is addressed to, uh, you know, the presentation from Mexico. I'm sorry, I, you know, I'm, I can't pronounce your name, but um, it's very difficult to sometimes roll back programs like a cash transfer scheme, uh, even if you, you know, in 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 a sense, and where you are a democracy, where you are based on populist votes. Uh, sometimes even the results uh, belie the logic of continuing incentive schemes like cash transfers. <coughs> it's a question to, uh, to all of us is, uh, do we think of exits from policies at all uh, when we are evaluating? It's also a recommendation. I mean, we are an NGO. We can endlessly work on issues and programs and projects. But one of the biggest challenges before us is, when do we exit? So I just would like, I mean, it's a great policy, the cash transfer, and in India also we are, you know, sometimes we uphold the Mexico example, but the logic is, you know, is questionable sometimes. So I'd like you to reflect on that. Okay, thank you. Uh, yes. Here he comes with the microphone. Hello. I'm uh, Patton, Mundamba Patton, uh, Secretary to the Government of Nagaland. For Madam Belis Melis, uh, you had mentioned about uh, uh, your report leading to policy changes. I uh, would like you to highlight a little bit on that, particularly the, the protocol or institution that you have set up for this. Okay, so me, uh, I think, do you want to? Yes, go ahead. Maybe 